My talk will be in two parts today with a little bit of time in between to do a little bit of singing and reflecting. Now, many of you know that I own a family farm in the rural part of southern Illinois, and nowadays two of my kids live on the farm and take care of things around there. We don't pay for a landline telephone anymore, uh, but we do still have internet provided by the county telephone co-op, and uh, so I still pay a bill, and uh, as we have done since the 1920s out on the farm. And I'm always amazed when I look at that bill and see that we are customer 99. Now, it's not often that people on as remote a farm as ours are early adopters of any kind of technology. And long before running water or electricity, we had a phone line out at the farm. The reason the family were early adopters of the telephone has to do with an old folk tradition that certain chosen people can read a particular Bible verse three times and they can stop the flow of blood. Now, my grandmother was one of those certain people. It's called the blood verse. It's Ezekiel 16.6. And the verse goes like this. In the King James Version, of course, because that's what my grandmother used. And when I passed by thee, and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. And she would read that three times. Now, before the arrival of the telephone in the county, my grandmother was known to be one of those people who could stop the bleeding by reciting that verse three times. Now, and this was a very valuable service in a rural area where we didn't have any doctors or uh, hospitals. Uh, we didn't even have uh, ambulance service until long after I moved away. And, you know, in agricultural life, there are quite a few accidents and uh, some bleeding going on. So, my grandmother's skill was a valuable commodity in the neighborhood, and when the telephone became a thing, somebody, I'm not sure who, decided that the repetition of the blood verse was just as effective on those wires, long distance, if you will. And so, my family farm is today customer 99. And the telephone is a fascinating invention. It's ubiquitous, so we don't really think about it maybe anymore. Uh, from the get-go, however, the telephone has been about two-way conversation. The first words to travel by telephone were a plea for help. Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. Now, the theme of October is deep listening. And I suspect my grandmother was listening deeply when someone called who was bleeding. And I suspect that the person bleeding was listening very deeply to my grandmother reciting those words down that telephone line. By contrast, the first use of radio was a Christmas Eve service in 1906. The people who heard it were an audience and that audience had two choices, listen or don't. The advent of the radio and its effects on human society can't be overstated. Already we had telegraphs and telephones, uh, phonograph machines that would play recorded music, and all of these innovations, however, were about private experience. You could do them in your home. For example, the news of the death of Abraham Lincoln was announced around the world by telegraph, but it took print journalism to actually get those words out to the larger public. But radio was different. Suddenly, millions of people could experience the same thing simultaneously. One contemporary commentator said of the advent of radio, there is now very little danger that Americans will resort to the vice of thinking. Now then, next came the probing eye of the television camera that could focus on one drop of sweat or eventually one fly in the hair and could broadcast that all over the world to hundreds of millions of people simultaneously. As a 20th century philosopher of media, Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. Yeah, the medium of the telephone 
produces the message of communication, doesn't it? We can talk. The medium of radio and television is mass and it is one way. And now our radios and our televisions are on our phones. Marshall McLuhan said, we become what we behold. We shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. Or, as he rephrased it a little bit more ominously, first we build the tools, then they build us. I'll be back in a few moments. In part two, I want to consider the idea of competing culture industries. Uh, nowadays, critiques of European Enlightenment ideas and projects is commonplace. Uh, the European Enlightenment clearly, for example, led to the disaster of European colonialism. And this critique is not new, even though it sometimes sounds new. It merely took a long time for it to escape the bounds of philosophy and the academy to enter into the American cultural conversation. The idea comes initially from a book titled Dialectic of the Enlightenment, published back in 1947 and written for the most part during the course of the Second World War by Max Horkenheimer and Theodore Adorno, who were two of the great Frankfurt, Frankfurt School philosophers. As two thinkers who had lived through the advent of telephone and then radio and then watched the rise of the fascists across Europe, the lesson appeared clear to them. The one-way communication of mass media is extremely dangerous in the hands of fear mongers. Now, we hear a lot nowadays about critical race theory, where the term white supremacy and current usage comes from. The book Dialectic of the Enlightenment invented those understandings. Central to the thinking of Horkheimer and Adorno was the tension between freedom and oppression. Their ideas remain important, central to us today. For example, Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, has read very deeply into the Frankfurt School uh, of Critical Theory and has helped her uh, develop the ideas that are behind Black Lives Matter. Both Horkheimer and Adorno were European Jews who had fled the rise of Nazism and both lost family to the Holocaust. The Frankfurt School philosophers were Marxists and they were baffled by a simple fact. Marx's predictions had not come to fruition. As a matter of fact, what had happened in the case of the rise of fascism was exactly the opposite of what Karl Marx had predicted. In the case of fascism, instead of a revolution of leftist working class people, the forces of production, the workers, had in fact in large numbers sided with that means of production, the bourgeoisie, and created a mass movement in fascism rather than a mass movement toward freedom. So, what had happened? Uh, we have to remember that fascism is the victory of superstition, myth, and irrationality over the projects of the Enlightenment. But with the defeat of fascism, Adorno and Horkheimer did not see that rise in rationality or liberalism among the victorious Western democracies. Instead, Western democracies, they thought, were embracing the superstitions and the myths and the irrationalities of fascism and disseminating those ideas through a term they invented, the culture industry. And they saw that as a system designed, according to them, to create artificial desires rather than creating justice and equality. Now, if you've been listening closely, you've already heard that Adorno and Horkheimer were tracing exactly what has been intensifying here in the United States and some other parts of the world in recent years. A rise in superstition, myth, and irrationality, and most of all, fear. The fact is, 
Frankfurt School philosophers were very good at tracing and highlighting the dynamics of oppression, but their solution to the issues they highlighted was a revolution of the working class, something which we can certainly see is increasingly unlikely. When I was a boy, the working class of my parents' generation did indeed lean toward the left. Now, that's not the case for perhaps a majority of poor people in the United States. Through various forces within the culture industry, many among the poorest Americans have shifted toward the right. It is the privileged who have shifted toward the more leftist ideas of Horkheimer and Adorno. And the result is what we see today, right-wing populism. Whatever the outcome of the upcoming election, this dynamic will remain in our culture. So here's my two cents worth of analysis on this dynamic. The culture industry has now bifurcated. It's broken in two. And yes, actually there is a liberal media bias in the media created by the cultural elite, the educated, us, Newspapers and their websites, magazines and their websites, media outlets, books, movies, radio, television, and the rising social media. It's a left-leaning cultural industry. Whatever the left-leaning culture industry is promoting, freedom or whatever, we can debate that, but it is happening. And in response, we're seeing the right wing developing an alternative to that culture industry uh, of the elite, something, its mirror image, its opposite. QAnon is the latest phenomenon in the long line of right wing ideas that go back to the John Birch Society from good old middle American in the Annapolis, Indiana. Yeah, it's middle America. One culture industry worships at the altar of rationality and evidence and education, and the other culture industry worships at the altar of superstition and myth and irrationality. One promotes progress and hope. One promotes nostalgia and fear. The best solution to the dynamic that Adorno and Horkheimer described long ago the only workable solution, as far as I can see, is the reconciliation between the two culture industries, which means that progressive people will educate ourselves about the concern of the oppressed, all of the oppressed, not just the ones that we like. The push of radio, in contrast to the pull of the telephone, is very much with us today. Where then is that deep listening? Where's the hearing of others now? I would call it a spiritual practice, the spiritual practice of listening and conversing rather than pontificating and arguing. And that's a tough discipline. It's right up there with asceticism and sitting naked on top of a pillar out in the middle of the desert. Still, we are called to practice conversation, despite the difficulty, despite the ugliness of the cultural and political ideas of the other side. In liberal democracies, there simply can't be another side if those democracies are to function and to survive. Listening rather than arguing. Democracy can't work when every message is out of a radio pontificating because democracy is, in its essence, about dialogue. Winning this time implies that there will be a next time, and often a reckoning, and around and around that dynamic goes. In the 1920s, a critic wrote of the advent of radio, thus dies the art of conversation. Yeah, we humanists necessarily combat that trend we stand against it. We are telephone people, not radio people. And many of you know that we have a YouTube channel, a new one called The Den of Conversation. Uh, that title is based on a phrase from the British literary 
critic Terry Eagleton, who wrote, quote, the den of conversation is as much meaning as we shall ever have. And I like that phrase a lot. That is a profoundly free thinking sort of statement. The den of conversation is as much meaning as we shall ever have. We humans generate it together. Imagine for a moment that what human conversation has given us. Stoicism, Epicureanism, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, the Florence of the Renaissance, Shakespeare's London, the Paris of the 1920s, the Harlem Renaissance, Greenwich Village, or North Beach, San Francisco, back in the 1950s, Liverpool, at the time of the Beatles, the Seattle Sound, that led to grunge coming out of the clubs and those Bronx clubs of the 1970s where hip hop originated. Look at that and see that perspective and suddenly a view appears of a crucible of human communication. Eagleton's phrase does not sound quite so bleak when we think about what conversation has done. All we have, why ever would we want more as human beings? Why ever would we want more than sharing ideas? Would we really want a voice from on high coming to proclaim the once and final truth? Isn't the mystery more beautiful? The stabs in the dark of the millions of human beings who have taken their part in this large and long den of conversation. That's why I believe in community, a place where people talk with each other in coffee houses and bars and streets and market squares, even in some churches and public spaces and the den of conversation. And we're doing our best in this virtual time to, to recreate that idea. We want conversation. We want the words in the public square, because that is the most fearful thing for oppressors, is people openly talking with each other. Of course, all of us want what we want, and we want everybody to think and love and uh, do as we do, and some of us are willing to force that upon others. And I guess that's natural for us human beings. It's gut, it's emotion, but it's not about democracy. We humans have an extraordinary feature. and It's not easy to find, but it's right there if uh, you uh, read the owner's manual. And what that is, is reason and empathy. At the same time, both reason and empathy. How? Do you argue with a blank? Mm, well, why would you argue? Don't. Just don't. How about talking? How about listening instead? Because we might learn something, even if it isn't the subject of that particular conversation, something passing by. Yeah, the evidence suggests that no arguments will ever change a person's mind. Listening and discussing calmly, however, that is a spiritual practice that just might help our situation. Being a free thinker means accepting and striving for personal and cultural growth, for self-cultivation and for a better society. Not answers, but striving, staying in community and conversation, collective learning, collective action. Whether the information is coming from a conversation or a book or a website, oh, okay, or TV or radio or the stage, for information to be exchanged, we have to embrace the lessons of the telephone, which is about two-way conversation, cooperation listening. I know that's kind of an obvious statement, but think about how little of that is happening in this political season. We humanists, we free thinkers, we liberal religionists, we can be the change. We can be telephone people.